Um, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome our final storyteller for the evening, the amazing Martin Thackeray. So it's the last story of the night, everybody, and it starts with a bang from a gun that marks the beginning of a foot race very early in the morning on a Saturday morning in the center of Ohio. And I am 17 years old, and I am in my second week of my freshman year of college, and I am very excited to be competing in my very first competitive cross-country race. And that uh, feeling is shared by all the other college-age kids around me who are also competing, you know, because we are going to be competing against each other for the rest of our collegiate running career. And right now, nobody knows who amongst us is the best runner. You can feel all of us checking each other out. You know, we all are skinny guys. And really, you're trying to look into the other eyes to see who has that quality to be able to reach into that spirit in their soul and find that essence that will give them the fortitude to rise above the pack and win the race. And so, the gun goes off and we all begin running. And I, no joke, am running faster and better than I ever have in my entire life. Some might say I am running like the wind. <laughs> and it's a 10 mile race. And it's not long into the race, two or three miles, when, no joke, there is literally no longer anybody around me. Because it turns out that I am really, really bad at running. <laughs> But I knew I was the worst runner on my team, but I held out hope that there would be another college-age kid somewhere in the vast central Ohio region who would come to this race and literally give me a run for my money. But it turns out that I am so bad that even the second worst runner has literally left me in the dust. And I am running now by myself across fields and backcountry roads, trying my best to stay on a course. It's very difficult to understand where the course goes when you are completely by yourself. <laughs> and I am thinking to myself about how there are so many songs and written and so many poems and so many documentaries and, and stories about great athletic heroes who've overcome hardships <laughs> to win whatever sport it is they're competing in. And I am thinking to myself how hard it must be for those who are the best at what they do. <laughs> but if you ask me, the real heroes are those who keep running, even though literally no one else is watching. <laughs> And not only would nobody care, no one would even notice. You <laughs> wouldn't go around to find someone and explain to them there's a race happening and I'm losing it, you know? And, and all those people who are at the front of the pack, they're all competing with each other, but I'm in fact competing with the most fierce competitor, which is my own sense of self-worth. <laughs> As I am wondering why am I running across country when I'm so bad at this. And I know why. It's because, because a lot of social currency it comes from how good we are at sports, particularly when you're a boy growing up. And I played on various sports teams in high school. And I was not good at anything. I thought, okay, you know, in college, I'm going to reinvent myself. And I am going to choose a sport that I already know how to do. Running. It can't be that hard. It is difficult, both physically and psychologically, you know? I mean, just the night before this race, uh, psychologically difficult because I had to go to bed early, which is difficult in your second week of college to go to bed early because it means you have to fall asleep while all the sounds of everybody else in your dorm building are, are wafting in. Everybody's celebrating. Everybody getting to know each other. Everybody making the friends that they will have for the rest of their college career, that they will have for the rest of their lives, the friends that will hold their hands. <laughs> And they die and pass that long good night. And 
I'm telling myself, no, the reason I'm going to bed early here is just because tomorrow I am going to be an athletic hero. <laughs> an idea somewhat mitigated by the fact that on the other side of my dorm room, my roommate has also gone to bed early. Not because he is in sort of uh, athletic dreams, but because he's an antisocial guy. And the school had put me together with him. I just met him two weeks ago, and the first thing I thought was like, wow, his eyes are really wide apart on his head. <laughs> I never talked about it with him. It didn't seem right. Uh, and he didn't care that he didn't have any friends. And I thought to myself, maybe I'm fooling myself. Maybe I'm going to bed early because I don't have any friends. And I told myself, stop thinking like that. You go to bed early. You, you push you don't have any friends. It's the beginning of college, you know? And it's with this anxiety mixed with the anxiety hoping that there will be at least one other person who is worse than me tomorrow at the race. I fall asleep to that until I'm awoken at 2 in the morning violently because a fire alarm is going off. And I don't know if all of you guys were raised in fire stations and are used to being woken up by fire alarms, but not me, okay, you know? And my hat's off to whoever invented the fire alarm because I woke up 100% convinced I was engulfed in flames. <laughs> it was that kind of panic. And I leapt from my bed and I sprinted to the, the door of my dorm room, which is only six feet away. It was a very short sprint. <laughs> and I found it was locked. And, and I, maybe the rest of you would not be flummoxed by a door locked on like your side of the door, you know? Uh, but I grew up in a house, we never locked the front door. I never saw a key in my life growing up. And so I just yelled to my roommate, it's like, Trevor! Trevor, you locked the door! And implicit in my barking at him is the accusation that when we perish, Trevor, it's your fault. <laughs> Trevor then springs up, and he's working on the door, and I have a moment to step back and look down at myself and think, maybe I should put on some clothes. <laughs> because all I am wearing, okay, like literally the only thing is just a, a very <laughs> simple pair of small white briefs that are derisively known as tighty whiteies. <laughs> They're the exact same kind of underwear that I have been wearing ever since I stopped wearing diapers. <laughs> and the reason I'm still wearing them is because at this point in my life, I have yet to have a girlfriend to tell me, don't wear those. <laughs> but that thought went out of my mind because before you knew it, the door was thrown open and this, this light cast into the room, this light that was taken this way towards salvation, towards survival, towards freedom. And Trevor and I both bolted out of the room, our shoulders colliding as we sprinted down the hallway towards the front door of the building. Now to be clear, the front door of the building is only six feet away from the door of our room. Again, a very short sprint. And we throw open the front door of the building, we tumble on outside into the early September night air of Ohio, which is it's warm. And with that fire alarm receded now inside the building, and the building was sort of breathing our hands on our knees, we were just happy to be alive. I remember how peaceful it is. Also, there's, there's absolutely nobody around us. And I wonder where it is, everybody. And I then look up, and there's this sort of glass-enclosed uh, stairwell on the outside of the building. So you can literally see as everybody uh, from every single floor is making their way down the stairwell with a noticeably much smaller uh, degree of panic than what Trevor and I had to get out of the room. Because they all seem to understand there is no fire. Someone just pulled the fire alarm. And they are all still dressed in the same clothes they've been dressed in all day. Because for them, it's still just Friday night. And they're just all still having a really good time. And as they emerge from the building, well, they all wear the exact same expression, an expression I cannot replicate, you know? <laughs> to be able to know what that expression is, you literally have to walk out of the building and see a very skinny 17-year-old boy, very pale in the night, wearing nothing but tiny white pants. <laughs> and then next to him, another person wearing the identical Oh, 
everyone else we knew, and we said, can you please come get us when this is all clear? And Trevor and I made our way to a building that's open all night long because in the lobby there are some bathrooms you can use. And so the two of us go and wait in the lobby underneath the fluorescent lights thinking, this is not going to be good if someone walks in and sees us wait in the lobby. So we retreat to the bathroom. And then I realized, no, this is worse. <laughs> someone comes in the bathroom and finds it. So we retreat to a stall. And we're hiding in a stall. And I'm like, please, no one find us in here. Because this is going to be really hard to explain. <laughs> well, eventually, uh, my friend comes and gets us. He says, the coast is clear. You can all come out, you know. Nobody's found us. We better wait out to the door. My friend's totally laughing at us. And now, now I'm laughing, too. And, and, and as, I'm, as I'm running on this race, I'm like, you know what? Maybe that's the lesson to take away from us. Maybe I shouldn't care so much what other people think. Maybe I should greet everything with humor and laughter. And as I'm thinking this to myself, I, I hear a sound far behind me. And I look over my shoulder and I see far away, but getting closer, a whole pack of people who are running. And all of them are girls. <laughs> and this is the thing, OK? They stagger the start time of the boys and the girls, okay? Which brings a horror inside my heart. It's not just that the girls are gonna overtake me and everyone's gonna realize, oh, I'm even slower than the girls, which is a 17-year-old boy, it's very difficult to swallow. It's that I'm even slower with a very significant head start. <laughs> so I have to reach down deep into that spirit and access that essence that will give me the fortitude to run faster even than I've ever run in my life. And I do begin, and I just I begin sprinting, and I dig down deep. And I'm thinking to myself, I know this looks ridiculous. I know that any other person would be like, you know what, I've lost, please, I'll continue on your way. And I'm like, you're not today. I'm not losing to the girls. And there's the finish line, like a good football field away. And I am digging deep, and they're getting closer and closer. And they're all right around me, right behind me. And I'm like, no, I'm doing this. And I'm sprinting, sprinting, and I pass the finish line. And you know what? I won! Like, I, I didn't win at all, to be clear. <laughs> to be clear, I've lost by every single definition of the world. Uh, but yet, it's not as bad as it could have been. And for the second time in 12 hours, I'm, I'm bent over with my hands on my knees. And I'm panting, and I'm thinking, well, at least, you know, at least I did this. And, and I did this for the boys. That's what I did. Because I'm thinking that. I'm looking around at where the boys are. And you know what? There are no boys anywhere. Not, no boys in any single direction, uh, which is not entirely true. I look back at where I've just run from, at the other end of that long football field, and I see there all the boys now running towards the finish line. Because you see, not only do they stagger the start times between the boys and the girls, but the girls actually run a shorter race. And all of a sudden, I'm filled with this terrible horror to think that everyone think that I had just tried to fool everyone, that I just cheated and made it seem like I have beaten the rest of the boys by a, a number of lengths of football field. And yet, it is a testament to just how bad I was that nobody thought I cheated. <laughs> and everyone was like, you got lost, right? <laughs> you ended up on the girls' race, didn't you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and everybody laughed, and everyone thought it was funny, and I thought it was funny too. And I continued running cross country for the rest of that semester. I stopped after that. And for that entire semester though, I ran, and I went to every single race, and I never got better, <laughs> ever. <laughs> And I decided that what I was giving back to the community was that everyone else could all believe that they, in fact, were very fast, faster than they would have felt had I not been there. <laughs> and our coach, he would make fun of me. And he'd all in good spirit. Like, for training, he would make like a course that everyone had to run, and then he'd always draw like another course for Martin. And the course would be some absurd course to run on. And I thought that was pretty funny too. And when all was said and done, you know, within cross country, I think I did find my identity, who I am, which is to say, comic relief, that's who I am, all right? And I don't know, 30 years later, if any of those people are still running, but I can tell you this, I am still inadvertently making people laugh. So that's it, that's my story. Yeah.